I think when you have uh, elaborate offerings by way of an introduction of that sort, um, pleading humility is uh, a very sound strategy, so I thank you for exaggerating my contributions. But I, I, I also want to say that it's uh, an enormous privilege um, to follow my Chinese, Italian, French, and Kenyan Ugandan brother uh, in this particular regard, because I think that illustrates, in a very real sense, one of the most profound tensions around this question today. Uh, I agree that navigating spaces and defining identities is central to how one thinks about oneself and how one thinks about one's relationships with other. It's always interesting to see what people say when you say, where do you come from? There are those people who know immediately and say something quite specific. And there are people like me who say, the dogs and the horses are in Cape Town in South Africa, but I'm on three continents every month and for many months. Now, what does that say? It's, it's, it's a curious question, and I wouldn't have put it in that way without the way in which you spoke about it, Edward, because what it says is I think of myself as having multiple identities. I don't think of myself as having a single identity. And that, I think, has become characteristic of a lot of people who live in this somewhat ethereal and very elite space. It doesn't mean that you are rich. It doesn't mean that you are powerful. It does mean that you live in a world that is at some remove from the world in which a lot of other people live. And as we reflect on some of the political challenges that we're finding in the context of manifestations of so-called xenophobia in South Africa, or manifestations of populism in Eastern and Western Europe, or in the United States in rural areas, this is one part of this particular challenge. And I think we have to get to grips with that if we're going to play a useful role in trying to get us out of this dangerous sleepwalking mode in which we're lurching toward what is potentially a significant disaster under present circumstances. One last observation, if I may, based on what Edward said, it's this issue of, of narrative. You know, 10 years ago, I don't think I read more than two articles in a year that enjoined me to take a gendered perspective of everything. The last five years, I probably read 10 a week at least that enjoined me to do precisely that. And in the last 18 months, I scarcely read an article which doesn't use narrative as a starting point. So fashion is a funny thing, and it doesn't mean that any of these issues are unimportant or that we haven't been negligent in taking perspectives that ignore those dimensions, but it does mean that one needs to think carefully before one throws the word around in some sort of cavalier fashion. And because I'm going to offer you a narrative, I'm going to explain what I think narratives do. I think the first thing about narratives is they enable and encourage the taking of a perspective. When you advance a narrative, the narrative is never non-normative. It's never objective. It is specifically phrased around a particular objective. The second thing is narratives are intended to enable sense-making. So perspective taking and then sense making. Narratives are a bit like paradigms in the sense in which Thomas Kuhn used the phrase. They frame the context in which you ask questions and draw conclusions. But the third thing about narratives that may be the most dangerous element of them is implicit in every narrative is a set of power relationships. It determines who should do what to whom and who has the right to do what. That's the context in which we do these things. So 
being mindful, and that's the reason I'm drawing on what Edward said, being mindful of those dimensions is, I think, really important as we grapple with these particular challenges. So, let me see if I can use this in a meaningful way. You've seen that already. I just want to hold on to it for a second. Depending on how you count, there are either 54 or 55 countries in that space as well. It's roughly three times the size of the United States. It's over 8,000 kilometers from north to south. And it certainly isn't one entity except in the context of tectonic plates. So stop talking about it, all of us, as though it was China or something. It's not, right? It's either 54 or 55, this is a politically contested question, but it's either 54 or 55 countries. It's spread over an extraordinary landmass, and it constitutes an enormous degree of diversity. Now, it's worthwhile saying something about that diversity from the perspective of some of the other discussions, and again, something Edward said. You know, we throw this word nation state around. It's a composite noun. There are very few nation states. Hungary may sort of be a nation state, but there are jolly few nation states in the world. Germany is certainly not a nation state. France, arguably, because it's been an empire and then became a republic and then became a consulate and then became an empire again, and all sorts of other interesting things along the way. But so it's arguably a nation state, but no, nothing in Africa is a nation state, not even Rwanda. The reason why there was a gigantic massacre in 1994 in Rwanda is because two people who had, or two groups of people who had intermarried, been closely associated with one another for hundreds of years, suddenly decided they were different. Hutus massacred Tutsis, Tutsis were terrified. Pick your number, something between 600 and 800,000 people were killed with brutal instruments in four weeks. And the wounds are still raw. Rwanda's success masks that bit of history. It hasn't gone away yet. So if there's something for Europeans to feel guilty about, what I'd suggest is that it actually happened in the way in which you drew boundaries. You said straight lines were preferable to wobbly ones. You said that rivers and mountains were great borders. And then you divvied it up. But unfortunately, there were people living there. So a whole lot of different peoples who had different identities, spoke different languages, in some cases completely different cultural contexts and religions, were part of that whole remarkable experiment at social engineering conducted out of the Congress of Berlin. And a lot of the challenges that Africa has today are the product of that simple reality because identity, that of which I think myself to be, if it doesn't correlate with the space in which I find myself, and of a whole lot of other people who think of themselves as quite different to me, share that space with me, it becomes very difficult to adopt a Westphalian state-based model and then say it ought to work like this in the parameters of a constitution. Now, that's not an excuse. It's just a reality. So let's have a look at some of the consequences of that reality. I think the first thing that's worthwhile saying is that Africa's 20% of the land area of the Earth. It's got 17% of the population, but it only has 2.8% of global GDP at nominal rates. That says something. I'm not suggesting to the GDP is a good measure of anything, by the way, I don't think it is. But in as much as it gives you access to goods and services and allows you in some or other fashion to advance yourself, it's a meaningful measure. It's not a good measure, but it's a meaningful measure. If you take it to purchasing power parity, which is certainly more relevant 
in practical terms, then that share goes up to 5.04%. But if you bear in mind it's 20% of the land area and 17% of the population, it's still not anything that suggests that opportunity is widespread within those parameters. But stuff's been happening because of a series of developments that took place in Africa roughly from the turn of the century. The shift from the Organization for African Unity to the African Union, certain parameters that were built into the African Union regarding good governance, certain efforts at improving governance, creating an African peer review mechanism, creating a partnership, hasn't been terribly successful, but creating a partnership, the new partnership for Africa's development, NEPAD, all of these things contributed to appreciable growth and improvement within African spaces. So you can say today with some confidence that Africa is growing faster than the global average. But if you have a look at it, just look at the bottom right quadrant. If you have a look at it, you'll see that in 2019, the range is quite staggering. Ghana grew at 7.5%, Ethiopia at 7.4%, Angola grew at negative 0.3%, South Africa at 0.7%, Kenya at 5.6%. So countries are not growing at the same rate. And if you started to have a look at the Gini coefficients, i.e. measures of the distribution of wealth and opportunity within societies, they're all pretty awful. The ones who have the best Gini coefficients are very poor. The moment a country actually starts to develop highly significantly the 1% or the 0.1% or the whatever expression you want to use for this escalates and everybody, not everybody else, but significant numbers of others stay behind. So that's another dimension of the problem. But again, I'm making the point that there is no catharis paribus in this. Nothing is equal. If you look at it from a formal institutional perspective, the World Bank thinks some countries are doing rather well, the ones you'd expect, Ethiopia and Rwanda up there, Tanzania, Ghana, Mali, okay, a whole lot stuck in the middle, including Uganda, and others slipping down at the bottom. So again, there's no Africa in respect of this. There's a whole lot of different countries measured according to different criteria who perform differently. And in the recovery after the global financial crisis, some of those who have recovered have done so by taking on what are probably unsustainable levels of debt. Now, if at present interest rates that debt is well applied, if it is invested and not used for current expenditure, if it's deployed within the country and not shipped out via corrupt channels into tax havens, then this is manageable. But the deployment of that debt matters hugely. So let me very quickly just summarize a frame in terms of the challenge today. The GDP has exceeded in the last 10 to 12 years the global average. And that's expected to continue until 2023 and six of the 10 fastest growing countries in the world at the moment are African. But Africa is the youngest region of the world by quite an order of magnitude. Have a look at the graph over here in terms of getting a sense of how that's occurring in terms of population of working age. 15 to 20 million are entering the working age group every single year. If everything works, if education systems work well, if employment opportunities derivative of some form of investment or entrepreneurship are available, this is a monumental dividend. It's the fastest growing youth population in the world. But there were two ifs at the beginning of that sentence. And therefore, thinking about, in the context of any form of partnership, how to make the youth dividend 
something that will be constructive in terms of enabling economic growth and poverty reduction in the future is really important. If you have a look at the distribution of wealth at the moment, the richest 10% by 2050 should be affecting a complete revolution in terms of social opportunity within the countries. But again, there are huge ifs associated with that particular question. This, by the way, is driving private equity investment in Africa under present circumstances, which is not necessarily terribly constructive, depending on the circumstances in which the investment take place, takes place and what the equity strategies are. But nonetheless, it's a statistic that matters. This is something which, in I'm completely ambivalent about. On one level, this is the most remarkable step forward towards the development of a collective identity in the African context. But on the other, it smacks actually of the sort of wonderful neoliberal period that we went through between roughly 1979 and roughly 2010. It's not clear how successful this integration is going to be. It's not clear what the normative parameters of its implementation are going to be. And it's not clear how we're going to manage, manage security concerns and relative positioning of one state vis-a-vis -vis another in the context of an open trade system. Now, the consequence of everything that I'm showing you is that there are a horrible number of African states that constitute those persons in the world living in extreme poverty. So a lot of them, I mean, the names are all there, I'm not going to read them, but Burundi, Benin, Angola, Central African Republic, Chad, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Equatorial Guinea, etc., are all perceived to be the major locales for extreme poverty by 2030, which, as you'll recall, is the point in respect of the SDGs where we are supposed to have put this behind us in a profound way. And if you have a look at the UN Human Development Index as another perspective on this particular challenge, you'll find that there aren't a lot of African states in the high human development category. In fact, there are only seven and they all start off at number 62 in the global rankings. And then there are another 14 in the medium human development category, and everyone else is behind those. So this is moving away from GDP per capita as a measure and thinking about the wider spectrum of developmental opportunity running the gamut from maternal mortality, infant mortality, child mortality, hospital beds per head of population, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, across the wider landscape. These are all serious challenges. It's worthwhile thinking briefly about what makes stuff work in this particular context. And I think the points that have been made about sustainable development not necessarily being the right perspective in respect of these issues are spot on. But broadly, to enable a good life for people in a geographical space, you have to have an appropriate degree of safety and security so that people can go about their lives. You have to have decent physical infrastructures, water power, transport, and ICT. You have to have good human capital, and that means housing, health, education, and training. You have to have policies that encourage investors, whether domestic or international, to put capital at risk in search of reward. And you have to have sound institutions, courts, ministries, uh, and related institutions that hold the system together. If you have those, you tend to be on a path to improving welfare for citizens. If you don't, you have to rationalize and make excuses of the sort that Edward was referring to earlier. In Africa, there are two fundamental constraints right now. Physical infrastructure is generally speaking poor. The more landlocked states have much more problems in this regard, but even coastal states 
have significant uh, deficits in this regard. The reason why intra-African trade is as bad as it is is because the original lines of communication were structured around colonial metropolitan approaches. So stuff went out of the Francophonie into France, stuff went out of those areas that Britain controlled into Britain, and so on. Not too many of those problems have been adequately overcome at present. The picture that you can see in the top paragraph over there is a border post that I'm very familiar with that goes out into Zambia and Botswana. Uh, and that's what it looks like most of the time. The second deficit lies in education. And there are some quite staggering figures in respect of that. It's both access to school with very high percentages of youth of primary school age and higher percentages of youth at secondary school age not getting access to formal education today. And then there are problems in addition to that with regard to the quality of education in the schools themselves. Now think about that youth dividend problem that I was talking about earlier. I can't think of anything more challenging at this time than having hundreds of millions of young people entering work, entering gainful employment, entering entrepreneurial spaces over the course of the next 30 to 40 years who are not prepared for the challenges that this first biodigital post-industrial revolution that's upon us now are going to bring. So if you want to think about a European African partnership, I'd suggest those are the two areas with due deference to the need to have joint agency, shared understanding of the challenges. But I think those are the two areas on which it's important to focus. I'm not going to go through the details of this. Anyone who wants the slides can have them. But the key issues, there are 650 million persons in Africa who do not have access to modern energy today. You cannot have a viable society moving forward in the 21st century without that. And the challenges of providing modern energy while simultaneously striving for deep decarbonization and a shift to renewables are very large. And that requires deep thinking about energy transitions while not dealing, or while dealing with the issue of ensuring that energy poverty can be eliminated. And the second challenge is this challenge that I expressed in respect of education. There broadly are the figures. One-fifth of six to 11, not in school. One-third between 12 and, sorry, 12 to 14, not in school and almost 60% of youth between 15 and 17 not in school. These are UNESCO figures. I don't think there's an agenda behind them, if I can put it that way. So without urgent action in those spaces, the challenge will continue, and politicians will keep on making excuses in respect of these because they don't have the instruments to hand to be able to solve for them. So if we are caring of, in my case, my brothers and sisters, but in your case, or many of your cases, perhaps the other, love thy neighbor as thyself, then these, I think, are the challenges that we have to address. Just by way of setting up the panel on migration, I'm just going to show you these. These are IPCC graphs indicating what the modeling suggests under different scenarios you'll find that large portions of Africa are orange to red in all of them. That means highly significant increases in respect of drought, highly significant increases in respect of flooding. So circling back to the discussion around climate and ecosystemic impacts this morning, recognize that if one does not deal with the big problem that requires collective action at the global scale, we worsen this problem highly significantly. And if we don't find ways of partnering respectfully, constructively, and creatively, 
in respect of infrastructure provision and education, the migration panel is going to have a busy time. Thanks very much.